Hey, I want to say welcome to Corinth this weekend. My name's Josh, and I am so glad you're with us. Whether you're a regular at Corinth or whether this is your first time joining us, we hope you have a great day wherever you are. If you're like me, you're thinking, is this whole thing real? Everything just seems so different, so uncertain. But in the midst of all of that, I know two things that still are true. God is still God, and we are still his church. See, the presence of problems can't dismiss God's presence from our life. And we're still the body of Christ, and social distancing doesn't mean social isolation, which is why we're still gathered today. So as we gather around a a living room or a TV or wherever you might be, we want to give you a few tips to how to get the most out of today. The first is this. If you have a cell phone, uh, hop on over to Corinth.cc, especially if it's your first time. Fill that short tab out that says I'm new and just let us know who you are and and how you're watching. And then, this goes for all of us, let's just put that cell phone in the other room for the next 45 minutes. I I think we'll get the most out of our time uh, living undistracted. If you're watching on Facebook, if you could share that share that video at the bottom there, just uh, click the share button so your friends and family can catch it in their stream as well. Here in a moment, Jeremy and the band are going to lead in a couple songs, and uh, we want to invite you to sing along. If that's weird, uh, that's okay too. Just listen in and let the truth of the music and of the songs speak to your soul in, the, in, in, in this uncertain time. Finally, at the end, we're going to encourage you to share communion together with your family or your group, whoever's watching with you. So be creative, whether that's pretzels and orange juice or saltines and Capri Suns. The important thing is just to remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us. Finally, I want to just remind us of this promise. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that's what we've done today. We've drawn near to God, albeit in a slightly different way than normal, probably. But the promise is he's going to draw near to us in this moment. So lean into that promise, and let's have a great day.
young I remember growing up in a Baptist church with my mother and my father and my siblings um, I remember the hymnal singing and getting dressed up in my Sunday best which I absolutely hated and the Easter egg hunts that we would have in the big old lawn um, we moved unfortunately from Atlanta and we lost our church when I got older I got married when I became an adult and thought I knew everything. And unfortunately, that was the start of the road to destruction for me. That include a, included a lot of abuse and addictions for me. And about 11 years ago, I was blessed with the birth of my son, who the doctor said I would never have. He would never be here, never survive. and. God proved him wrong. At that point, it was kind of a turning point for me in my mind that I realized I wasn't just living for myself, I was living for another being that needed me and depended on me. A few years ago, we came to Corinth and a lot of struggles. It was not easy getting to that point to walk back into a church. Um, but through my prayers, we found Corinth, and I was accepted. My son was accepted. He asked me about it last fall if he could get baptized, and I became overjoyed just to know that I had finally done something right to lead my son to walk with Christ, and that's what he wanted. I literally thought when 
we started coming to Corinth that the church was literally going to burn down when I walked in, but it didn't. I finally had peace. I was welcomed with open arms, not only by the church, but by my family when I returned to them. Being seven years clean now is a blessing and it's a struggle, but through church, my faith, I know I can do it. Um, I know that my past does not define me anymore. I am a child of God and I am loved. I am here to be baptized, to walk with the Lord and grow closer to him. I want to thank my son, Robert, who's inspired me with his baptism to be baptized. Um, Miss Robin Hudson, Josh Moore, who's been helping me through this process. Luke Sayer, who helped Robert become baptized and is an amazing youth minister. Um, and of course, all of the sermons that Adam preaches every Sunday that seem to fill my soul to the point that I, I feel it in my spirit. And of course, the Lord above who has walked me through step by step and he's never left me. And I choose today to accept the Lord as my savior. just like Desiree was sharing there in her testimony. She could look back in her life and see how God had been carrying her all along. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes when we look back, that's when we can see what God has been up to. But even in this present, no matter what we're facing, whether it's the fire, the flood, a pandemic, a market crash, a struggle, we know that our God is with us. Even when we can't feel him, even when we can't see him, we believe and know that he is there. We are not alone. Let's continue to sing to him this morning. There's a grace when the heart is on the fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There is another in the
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Jesus, we thank you that you never stop working on our behalf. Jesus, we come to you today asking for help at this time, asking you to, to give us strength to live for you today. We come and surrender to you, King Jesus, and ask that you would work through us for your kingdom and your glory. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, all, my name's Adam, and I'm the senior minister here at Corinth. And uh, before we, we jump into the, the sermon time, I, I just wanted to take a second and just say, uh, thanks for tuning in today. Um, if you're a guest with us, or maybe just uh, this showed up in your timeline because uh, one of your friends shared it, thanks for tuning in uh, today. You know, I, I know that this is a, a weird time and that we're all scattered, but I am confident, and I hope that you will be as well, that the Lord is going to do something incredible through this time, reminding people that the church is not a place, it's a people. It's not a building, it's a body of believers. And he's going to draw great attention to himself and his church will be stronger through all of this. Now, I, I want to remind you that in the time of crisis like this, this is a great time to uh, practice generosity. And you may find yourselves having um, opportunities to practice generosity in a way that you have never practiced it before. Believe it or not, I actually had somebody uh, send me a note saying they had um, a whole bunch of toilet paper they had stumbled into and that they were willing to give it away. And to me, that is the definition of generosity. It's being generous with that which is scarce in our world today. So um, please continue to be generous, continue to support what God is doing here at Corinth as we look to help uh, people and meet their needs. Uh, you can uh, give by mailing it to the church. You can bring it up to the church building. We do have a uh, minimal staff here during this time, or you can always give um, over online at corinth.cc. Just go up to the top there and click the give button. But thank you for your generosity, and uh, thank you for being the church where you find yourself. Now let's do some preaching today. Well, it was a couple of weeks ago, the last time that uh, we were together, that we started a brand new series called Storyline. And the basic idea of it is this, everybody loves a story. Uh, whether it's a once upon a time story, whether it's a historical story, whether it's a TV show or a movie, everybody loves a great story. And so it's no surprise that whenever Jesus showed up on earth, he came around teaching, and one of his primary teaching tools was telling a good story. And so we're, we're spending a few weeks just looking at these stories here that he told. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at um, a story about the kingdom of heaven and that how Jesus was trying to help us to see that when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, whenever you get that, you're going to give up nothing when you give up everything. Okay. Uh, today, as we, we look at this uh, sto another story of Jesus, um, I think we could sum it all up into two words. And our two words are just this, be ready. Uh, be ready. We, we need to be prepared. We need to get ready. We have to be ready for what is coming down the road. Now, now we, we know this, right? We, we know that we uh, need to be people who, who are ready. There, there are quotes all over the place about this idea of being ready or, or preparation. Let me share with you just a couple of them. One of my favorite quotes comes from Benjamin Franklin. I, I thought it came from John Wooden, the basketball coach, but it actually comes from Ben Franklin. And it just says this, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. That's true truth, isn't it? I mean, it really is. If you're not going to be somebody who is preparing, you are going to be somebody who's preparing to fail. I love this quote. It, it's, it says this, every battle is won or lost before it is fought. And that's from Sun Tzu, from The Art of War, that old book from the 6th century BC. And this is just true. Every battle is won or lost before it is fought. We, we need to be prepared. You know, in my days uh, playing sports back whenever I was younger and still able to move, um, I had coaches just, just drill this into our heads. You got to be ready. You got to be prepared. Whatever the other team throws at you, whatever the referees throw at you, whatever the, the crowd throws at you, you've got to be ready. You got to be prepared, all right? And, and I remember in college, I, our coach, what he would do is that at the end of practice, whenever we were already tired, he would take us and make us a sprint up and down the court about 10 times or so, and then he would say, you can't leave until you make 10 free throws in a row. 
be exhausted, couldn't breathe, hands on the knees. But his thought was this, I want you to be ready to make the shots when they count, when you have nothing left in the tank here in practice so that you can be ready whenever it comes time in the game. You got to be ready. If you're a leader, you, you know this. You got to be ready. You got to be prepared. You've got to have your business ready for whatever comes. Okay. We have to be ready. And that's something Jesus believed as well. And Jesus wanted us to be ready, but, but Jesus' thoughts weren't, weren't he, he didn't want us to be prepared for a basketball game. He, didn't, he wasn't even as concerned about our, our business. Jesus wanted us to be ready for something that is much far more important. So there's much more important than that. And so um, in this story today, we're going to see how Jesus wants us to be ready for something that's coming in the future. And that if we fail to prepare for this, we truly are preparing to fail. And we find the story in Matthew chapter 25. So if you've got a Bible there, I'd invite you to open it up. Um, if you don't have one there, maybe you've got an iPad handy or, or, or your phone handy, and just go over to Bible.com or BibleGateway.com and look up Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at the first 13 verses today. But let me just kind of set the scene for you um, in this story. So chapter 21 in Matthew marks the beginning of the last week of Jesus's life on earth. So the, the, the cross is looming in the foreground now. It's just a matter of days before he's going to be betrayed, handed over, uh, falsely accused, tried, and crucified. And so in this last week, Jesus knows, I got a lot of things I need to do. I got a lot of things that I need to say. And he's, he's got some stuff on his mind. And it's not just the fact that he's going to be dying for the sins of mankind. It's not that. He's like, hey, I, I, I need to make sure that the guys are ready for what's coming in the future. He's got his second coming in mind. So one of the topics that he just kind of goes to is this, this idea of, hey, y'all, I just want you to be ready. I want you to be prepared. Be ready for my return. And he's, he's pointing off into the future and he's saying, look, I, I, I know what's coming down the road. That there is coming a day, nobody knows when I'm going to come back, but I can tell you I am coming back. The question is, when I do, will you be ready? And so he just starts telling several stories right in a row about this idea. You need to be ready. Got to be prepared. Got to be ready to go. He tells a story about Noah and how they were ready. He talks about how big of a surprise the second coming is going to be. And there's going to be two people out in the field. There's going to be two people at the mill. One's going to be left. One's going to be taken away. And story after story, Jesus is returning home to this idea. You pay attention. You be ready. Because to Jesus, this is important. There's urgency here. He doesn't want anyone to be left out because they weren't ready. So it's there that he tells this story. It's in Matthew chapter 25. Listen to what it is that he says. He says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. And the foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the, the foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. And said, go to those who sell oil and, and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And then Jesus says this, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. It's quite the story, isn't it? Jesus is, is talking about a wedding. Now, I, I don't know about you. Whenever I think of a wedding, I think of the weddings that I get to be a part of as, as a preacher. 
Yeah, there, 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 there's a lot that goes into it. You know, you've got to you got to find the venue, you got to book the venue, you've got to you know uh, buy the dresses, you got to buy or you got to book a caterer. You know, you got to book the photographer, and then you know, the most important thing, you actually have to find somebody who's going to marry you, right? You know, it's just it's a big big deal. Um, it's also an expensive deal. So they did a survey uh, last year. It's called the Knot. That's K N O T 2019 Real Weddings sur- uh, Study, and they surveyed 27,000 couples who were married in the year 2019. And and based on the answers, they found out what the national average cost of a wedding is. Now, but before I tell you this number, if you are a dad of a daughter uh, who has who has not been married yet, and you know a wedding is probably coming in the future. I need you to make sure that you are sitting down on your couch, that somebody has a fan there next to you, and maybe a glass of water there for you, okay? Because this is what they found. In 2019, the average cost of a wedding in America cost $33,900. Now, that does include the cost of the engagement ring, but it doesn't include the cost of the honeymoon. It's a lot of cash, isn't it? That's expensive stuff. This is what my my brother, uh, he and his wife, they have uh, three girls now. And uh, whenever he called a few years ago to tell me that they had found out that they were having another girl, this is why his first words out of his mouth to me on the phone were, well, I got another wedding to pay for, okay? Because he knew right then, just a lot of costs coming up. Okay? So uh, weddings are a big deal. They're expensive, they're extravagant, they're a lot of fun, but as big of a deal as they are for us here in our day and age, uh, believe it or not, they were actually a bigger deal in Jesus's day, in that first century when Jesus is telling this story. Because one of the things that they would do, I mean, there's like a week-long uh, ceremony, a week-long celebration. And so after the, the ceremony had taken place, the, the whole village turned out to accompany the couple to their new home. So instead of thinking like the reception is at the same venue, think of it like, like this, that they throw a giant parade um, to the reception at the uh, bride and groom's brand new house. And, and whenever they, they did the parade, they went by the longest road possible so that they could make sure that they were able to connect with as many different people as they possibly could. And so typically, they didn't end up back at their house until very late at night. So that's the celebration that Jesus is talking about right here. And so you've got these 10 girls waiting at the reception location, waiting for the party to start. Five of them brought plenty of oil for their lamps, which would be how they would light up the last leg of the parade. But the other five didn't bring enough. They weren't ready. So they tried to borrow from the ones that did. They're told, no, you can't do that, okay, because then we won't have enough. And so these five, they head off to Dollar General to try to get more oil. But by the time they get back, they're not let in. Jesus says the door was shut. I don't know you. And so Jesus' point in this story is very, very simple. It's easy. If you're not ready, you will be left out. That's the point. If you're not ready, you're going to be left out. And so he's saying, if, if you don't want to be left out, you need to be wise. You need to be prepared. And you need to be warned that this is all real. I think that works as a pretty good outline today. So let's just kind of walk through that. Let's use that as an outline today. Be wise, be prepared, and be warned. So let's talk about it. Be wise. Jesus, that's what Jesus says. You need to to be wise. Because in the story, everybody knows the bridegroom's coming, okay? We're we're not talking about one group has secret knowledge and the other group doesn't that the other group doesn't have. Everybody knows why they're there. They're there to celebrate a wedding. They're supposed to have the oil. It's not a shock. They've only got one job here. Be ready. Light the lamps whenever they show up. That is your job. Five five were wise. They brought the oil. Five were unwise. They didn't bring the oil. And so uh, they were wise. Now, when the Bible talks about being wise versus being foolish, wisdom in the Bible is always this, knowing the right thing to do and then doing it. 
knowing the right thing to do and then doing it. Because it's not just about information. It's not just about knowing things. It's about actually putting it into practice and doing something with what you knew. Because you can know a lot of things and still act like a, a fool. I, I've got a buddy. His, uh, his son is brilliant like borderline genius on the IQ scale, um, one of the most academically gifted kids you, you would ever meet. And, and so my buddy loves to tell the story about his son, about how one day his son was walking by the stovetop, and you know how stoves have that little red light that says caution hot surface? Well, he looked at that, and he saw that none of the burners were on, and so he thought to himself, well, I know that that thing says that it's supposed to be hot, but I don't see any burners on, so I don't believe the red light on the oven. And so he took all this information in, and he says, no, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to do anything with that information. I'm going to test it out. And so he decided he was going to take his hand and place it right on the stovetop to see if it was truly hot. And you want to know what happened? He lost. He burnt his hand, right? He, he didn't use the knowledge that he had gathered. When the red light's on, the stove is hot. And he made a foolish decision. See, Jesus says to be wise it means you know what's right. You've got the right information. You know what's right. But then you do something with it. Earlier on in Jesus' ministry, he, he has the Sermon on the Mount. And as he wraps up the Sermon on the Mount, he tells this, another story. It's the story of the wise and the foolish builder. And he talks about how this wise man built his house upon the rock, that the, the rains came tumbling down, the floods came up, but the house on the rock stood firm. He says, but the house who built his man on the sand, who, the man who built his house upon the sand, well, he was a foolish man, and the rains came tumbling down, and the flood came up, and the house built on the sand went splat. And so Jesus describes wisdom and describes wise people like this. He says, everybody who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, that's the wise person. But everybody who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice, they're the fool. Wisdom is knowing what is right and then doing something about it. It is knowing the words of Jesus and putting them into practice. So you want to be prepared, right? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. You want to be prepared, don't you? You, you want to be prepared. You need to be wise. And if you want to be wise, do you want to know what wisdom really looks like? You got to take what Jesus says to do and actually do it. So whenever he says, Forgive others as your heavenly Father has forgiven you. Those aren't just words to know. That's an action to put into practice. Whenever he says, listen, if you have offended your brother and you know that they have something against you, then I'm telling you, you leave your place and you go and you be reconciled to them. Those aren't just words to know. That's something to put into practice. Whenever he says, give generously, we, we give generously. Whenever he says, and maybe this is important to hear today, do not worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's not just a pithy statement from Jesus. He wants us to put that into practice. You want to be ready? Be wise. You want to be ready? Be prepared. And I know that sounds like the same thing, and the reason that that sounds like the same thing is because it's the same thing, right? But that's what we want to do. We want to be prepared, and that's the difference between the two groups of girls here. Five are prepared. You know, they've got oil. And the other five, they're not. See, the problem's not a lack of information. The problem is a lack of preparation. That's what the issue is here. I mean, and I don't know what the deal is with this, this group of girls over here. I don't know why they didn't bring enough stuff. You know, maybe they just thought that they would be able to make it to the store in time. Or maybe they just thought that they were going to be able to borrow from other people. I, I don't know why they didn't prepare. We just know they didn't prepare. They weren't ready. And they ran out of the one thing that they needed most to get into the feast. They ran out of the oil that they needed. Now, just a real quick side note. I want to make sure you understand this. Because whenever you looked at these two groups of girls, on the outside, they, they both looked the same. On the outside, they, they looked the part. They had the right clothes, the right lamps, the, 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 the right torches. But they were nothing alike. Because one group was ready. One group was prepared, and the other group was not. 
and I, I find interesting, they, they tried to borrow. And they, they, they go to the group that's prepared, and they're like, dude, you got to help us out. You got to help us out here. We need, we need some oil. But they found out a, a tough lesson in life, didn't they? There are just some things in life you can't borrow. You just can't borrow them. I mean, you, you can borrow something like a phone charger. I'm sure every single one of us in the room has done this, right? You have borrowed a phone charger at some point. You left it in your car, so you asked a buddy or you asked you know, somebody in the house, hey, do you got a charger? I left mine at work. I left it in the car. I don't want to go out and get it. You can borrow something like that. You know, you can borrow somebody's car. You can borrow somebody's truck, you know, uh, but there are some things you just can't borrow. You, know, you, you can't borrow somebody's toothbrush if you forgot it. Um, that might be important information today. You, maybe you never have heard that today. If you forgot your toothbrush, don't borrow somebody else's, right? Um, you can't borrow somebody else's underwear. You just can't do that. And, and maybe more importantly, just hear this. You can't borrow somebody else's faith. You just can't do it. You have to be prepared. You have to have faith. It has to belong to, to you, you can't rest on the faith of your parents. You can't rest on the faith of your grandparents. You can't rest on the faith of your children, mom and dad. You have to be prepared. You have to be ready. Because you just can't borrow it. So be prepared. You want to be wise? You got to be ready. You got to be prepared. And then Jesus says this, be warned. He's like, I, I want you to be warned. I want you to be aware there's something coming. See, by the time these five foolish ones, they get back, it's too late. It's just too late for them. And that there are five words there that just are, are terrifying, they're sobering, they're heartbreaking. And Jesus says, and the door was shut. It was shut. That's heartbreaking because we're talking about inclusion and exclusion. That those who are in are safe. But those who are out are lost. And I'll tell you, this is one of those uncomfortable teachings of Jesus. You know, we, we kind of can sometimes just wish that this wasn't a thing, but here's the deal. It is a thing. This, we can be uncomfortable with it. That doesn't change the truthfulness of it. But what we do is we're, 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 we try to get super creative. And whenever we hear something like this, we're just like, oh, well, you know what? Oh, okay, maybe that's what, what the case is. But I, you know, nobody I would ever know, you know, would, would be unprepared like this. This is talking about, you know, other people that I'll never meet in my, my life. Or, or we'll, we'll just say, you know, Jesus is just being a little dramatic. He's trying to emphasize a point and to make his point even bigger. But there, there's really no way that God would leave people out. Because, you know, what this is talking about, this is giving the idea, you know, second coming. This is giving the idea of heaven and hell. And we can have trouble sometimes. We can have difficulty. We, we have difficulty getting comfortable with this idea that there are going to be people left out of the kingdom. And so we begin to rationalize. It's like, oh, you know, if there is a hell, well, then surely it's just for people like, you know, Osama bin Laden or Hitler or, you know, Joseph Stalin. I mean, surely that's what this is. It's reserved for the, the worst of the worst of the worst. I mean, it's not for, for people I would know or, or family that I, I might have. But, but, but Jesus says, and I'm telling you, it's more than just right here. You need to go through and read the, the words of Jesus. Jesus talks more about this idea than anybody else in all the scripture. That there are going to be people who look the part, who are left out because they're not ready. So they're going to be outside the door. Somebody once said that too often opportunity knocks, but by the time you disengage the chain, push back the bolt, unlock the two locks, and shut off the alarm, it's too late. And that's why Jesus is saying, hey, you've you got to keep watch. You got to pay attention. You got to be on guard. You got to be ready because you don't know the day or the hour. You don't know when this is coming. So you keep watching. You, you be warned because there's coming a day, he's saying, 
when I will return. And I don't want anyone, Jesus is saying, he's like, I don't want anyone to miss my arrival. So be wise. Be prepared. And be warned. So the question of the day is very simple. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you find yourself in the wise group or the foolish group? You have to seize the opportunity that is before you. It was back in the year 1874. There was an inventor by the name of Elisha Gray. And he actually transmitted a few notes of music over a telegraph wire. And he thought to himself, if I can send music, then perhaps I can send the human voice. And the New York Times reported predictions of a talking telegraph. And the public began to just grow eager, you know, for this to come to fruition. Well, just one year later, Gray believed that he had found the answer. He had this tin can like voice chambers connected by a wire and a liquid that could turn vibrations into signals. And that's what all came to his mind. But for whatever reason, he never put his idea on paper for two months, for two months. And then after he finally made the sketch and drew it all out, he waited four more days before he went to the patent office. And when he arrived, Mr. Gray was informed that just two hours earlier, a school teacher had come through the same doors with the same sketch and had already applied for the patent. That man's name? Alexander Graham Bell. And whenever you compared the sketches, the voice chambers, the wire, and the liquid, everything was identical. But the reason that we know the name Alexander Graham Bell and you've probably never heard the name Elisha Gray, simply because one man seized the opportunity when he could. And the other one waited until it was too late. One day, Jesus, our bridegroom, he's going to come for his bride. And when he does, You had better be sure that you are ready or you will be on the outside looking in. Bottom line this morning, simple. Don't wait until it's too late. So don't delay. Be wise, be prepared, and be warned. There is coming a day. So do not wait and do not delay. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, would you do something in our hearts, in our souls, in this moment? And would you stir up a a desire, a passion to be people who are welcomed in and not who are left out? People who are prepared, who are ready, who have put into practice the things that you have asked us to do so that whenever you do return, we will find ourselves ready to be with you. So God, for those who um, are watching in this moment and maybe they are uncertain, they are uncertain of whether or not they are ready, God, I pray that in this moment, that they would hear you calling to them. And that if they are confused and they're uncertain and they're scared and they don't know what to do, that they would reach out to a friend who knows you, who loves you, so they can hear just exactly what it is that you have in store for them. And Jesus, we thank you that you love us, that you died for us, that you were buried and three days later raised again so that all of us and all of those who will put their trust and their hope in you will never have to hear, I don't know who you are, but they will get to hear, come on in, come on in. And we pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, with this whole um, social distancing thing, uh, we're about a week into it now, and they've just told us that, you know, for the sake of 
our safety, to prevent the spread of the virus, the overwhelming of the health systems, that uh, we need to stay apart. And I was thinking about that this week, and while I know that's the right thing for us to be doing, um, I'm really glad that God didn't handle things that way. That Jesus actually came down from heaven to be near to us, and that he wasn't afraid of being close to us, and that he drew near to make us right. There's the story, it's in a Gospel of Mark, it's in chapter 1, where Jesus comes across a, a leper, and who was a guy that had literally had, was untouchable, you know, had to practice social distancing his, his entire existence. And it says that Jesus looked at this man and he was filled with compassion. And filled with compassion, he reached out and he touched him. And he healed him, saying, be clean. And as we gather together right now to take communion, I think that in the midst of everything going on, it's a great time to remember that, that Jesus came down and he was not afraid of being infected by us by the disease of our sin, but that he was willing to come down to reach out, to touch us and to say, let me make you clean. So in a couple of moments here, after we're, we're wrapped up, um, dads, I would encourage you, if you've got your family there, let's round them up. Let's pray together and let's, let's take communion together. If you're a single mom, gather your kids up Let's take communion together. If you're just there by yourself or with your, your, your wife or your husband, let, let's gather together. And in this moment, let's celebrate that God came down and came near. And he was not a distant God, but an ever-present God in Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. I hope it was a great hour together. And I hope you'll do what I'm going to do right now. I'm, I'm going to discuss uh, with my family and, and just remember Jesus together. I hope uh, you'll do that with your group as well. If you've got young kids, maybe read a Bible story together or uh, pray around the table or just at least name some things you're grateful for. Remember, if you do have kids of any age, watch those social media accounts and keep up with the emails so you don't miss out on what's coming up. We don't quite know what next week will look like, but if we're online, we'll be right back here. Check out corinth.cc slash live. And remember, this week, we don't just go to church. We are the church. So let's be the church this week and live intentionally. Let's remember the truth of Jesus in these uncertain times. We love you guys. Have a great week.